worked a lot um, in trying, you know, to um, make our businesses, uh, train them, and um, have them at a level where, you know, it's good to do business. They'll be happy and conduct business. Um, Adrian approached us with, with the course, and we thought, you know, this is something different. We have had other trainings, like, um, well, local and international. We've had, for instance, um, certified courses from UAE, um, Cyan for Tech, the Belize Center for Training, um, and th this was also, this was different, so we wanted to, you know, invite him and let the, the our members know um, what he does and, you know, try to make a difference in their organizations as well. So when I first, sorry, when I, when I first saw the courses itself, mm -hmm. c cultivating courage, mm -hmm. develop direction course, and uh, creating change course. I mean, Adrian, it sounds like you you will be able to uh, div to work on the movers and shakers of, <laughs> of this country after you leave. And so what I mean is, it sounds so ambitious. How do you enter into something and really inspire the individual participants that they can cultivate the courage that they need? Well, the reality is anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a very quick story of a woman called Agnes. Born in uh, Kosovo, um, her father is assassinated, her mother falls apart emotionally, she goes off to Ireland, um, she decides then she wants to go to India, become a nun, she goes to India, she's there for six years, and then on a train she decides, hey, no, no, I'm doing the wrong thing, I want to um, help the poor. So she stands underneath a tree with a branch and starts drawing the alphabet, and people, for, for children to learn how to, how to read, and a, a priest comes by, sees what she's doing, gives her 200 rupees, and instead of her putting the money in her pocket, she rents out two schools. Next thing you know, she's renting out more schools so she can uh, teach more kids. Then more, more some of the nuns that she used to be with, they then come with her. And next thing you know, she's got 25 places in Calcutta. Next thing you know, the Bishop of Venezuela sees what she's doing and says, we want to do the same, come here. Then next thing you know, she's in Australia, Panama, um, Papua New Guinea, United States. Now, she changed her name from Agnes to Teresa. And so she is what most people know as Mother Teresa. What the very interesting thing about her was when she left the nunnery to no longer want to be a nun, she was described as a very ordinary, unexceptional woman. If a very ordinary, unexceptional woman can end up with 4,000 people working for her and 1,000 donating their time, imagine what people like yourselves a lot more switched on than unexceptional and very ordinary can do. So it's not hard. You just have to try. You have to work out what you want in life and go for it. You know, and the, the biggest problem that people have is fear. Mm -hmm. They stop themselves from doing amazing things. Everybody's capable of so much. And we usually limit ourselves by saying those nasty two words, which I can't even say what they are. <laughs> and you know what they are. It's my first word is I. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. <laughs> now, it's interesting because when you talk about that, you're also talking about creating a space for yourself and employers also allowing employees to do things like take initiative. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when you talk about fair and uh, taking risk, mm -hmm. um, that might not be a part of the culture. So even though you may be one of the uh, people who would like to be a, a catalyst for change, how do you overcome some, or how do you encourage people in, in circumstances that may not be, uh, you know, the best in terms of an enabling environment to actually still go after the thing that they say they want to do, mm -hmm. but are not able to find the courage to do? I mean, it's a great, great question, and, and it's very difficult, clearly. You know, if your boss is not quite so switched on, trying to go against the grain is going to potentially cause you problems. So you have to be clever, don't you? But one thing that we all like, we, we like happy people. Mm -hmm. And we like optimistic people. You know, unless you are very unhappy or very pessimistic, you will gravitate towards happy and optimistic people. Yeah. So if it starts with yourself, who you are. And if you can be a happy person and with good social interactions. I mean, for instance, if I may touch my friend's hand for a second, mm -hmm. this is what you need. N-E-S-T-S, -S, your hand finger up there. Now, what is N-E-S-T-S? Nest. If you have good nutrition, people will notice that about you. If you do exercise, I'm looking at you too, you look nice and trim, etc. right? <laughs> you clearly do your exercise. Sleep, 
really important. You don't get enough sleep, you're going to be grumpy. The boss is going to notice it. They're not going to be so comfortable uh, trying to try new things. Thoughts, really important. Your thinking, being positive, optimistic, liking yourself but not being arrogant. And then finally, social support. If you have those five things, if you could develop yourself into being a good, nice person, or as we say in Australia, a nice bloke, <laughs> then as a consequence, you're going to end up inspiring the boss to give him a bit of a chance or her a chance. I, I have an important question because you, you were talking about uh, these different needs and there's one thing that always comes to mind and I think it would be part of the issues when you talk about cultivating change uh, within different workplaces, within a society, um, and a lot of times uh, you're working with people of different demographics. Mm -hmm. um, often the argument is that people can't necessarily reach that point of looking at things uh, like their happiness index if their basic needs aren't met. If I'm still mm -hmm. concerned about whether or not I can afford to buy or buy the ingredients to make dinner for my family or to have rent or to fulfill the basic psychological, uh, physiological needs mm -hmm. that uh, are necessary, how can I even begin to think of issues uh, like being uh, confident and, 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 and uh, cultivating change. Mm -hmm. So how do you respond to that? Well, first, you are right that although there is no correlation between happiness mm -hmm. and money, there is, if you're below the poverty line, when you don't have your shelter or your food, you don't know where you're going to be sleeping the following day, etc. well, then clearly it's difficult to be happy. But let me ask you, if you're in that situation or sitting under a bridge and just worrying about your problems, change anything? Clearly not. So yes, you are absolutely right that when you are poor, when things are not going well, and you know, I've had my fair share of that. I've slept in cars when I was going through university in Australia in winter to get my degree. So I do understand where you're yeah. coming about. Maybe not to the degree you're talking about, but nevertheless, I've done my fair share. And also I lived in West Africa for 18 months where, you know, you're lucky if you get electricity for more than two days before you get a 12 hour power cut, mm -hmm. etc. You wash out of a bucket, you get um, water maybe one or two days a week sometimes. So I understand a little, mm -hmm. but the reality is we can all make our lives better. And one of the easiest ways to do is to stop thinking negatively. Yeah. Now, <laughs> it, I, I like what you're, you're saying in terms of uh, concentrating on uh, happiness rather than the other things that you may choose to worry about. Mm -hmm. and I, I use that word choose because it's almost as if though we're socialized to think that it's a subconscious thing and you have no control over it. So when you talk about fear and worry and so many other things, people think that it's only human and that it's normal that I'm going to spend more time worrying about what I don't have and what I want in the future than concentrating on happiness and what I have now and how I can build on what I have. Mm -hmm. So. How do you take all of those, especially when you're talking about profits mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, business, uh, you know, changing your direction and, and moving uh, in, in directions that will increase profits? Mm -hmm. How do you get people to look at those intangibles and at the same time show how it could possibly relate to some of the, the, the things that they want, like the profits? Mm -hmm. I'll give you a, a very simple way that everybody in Belize can do, and it won't cost a cent. Hmm. Can all three of you smile for one second? There you go, right? <laughs> now, by doing that, you will improve productivity. Yeah. Now, let me explain where the proof of that is, because so far what I've done is given you words. Right? They did a research study where what they did is they asked an average-looking woman. They purposely chose an average-looking woman, whatever that is. <laughs> and they asked her to walk down the stairs, and as somebody was coming up, to smile at them but not say anything and just keep walking. That was what happened on 50% of the occasions, but on other 50% when, the, when she was walking down and somebody else would be coming up, she just ignored and just walked past. Now, at, once she had walked past, somebody else came along with a whole lot of pieces of paper and books, etc., and pretended to drop everything. And then they wanted to see who would help. And what they found was, as you can now work out, those who smiled, were more, were, uh, if the person had been smiled at, were more likely to then pick up all this paper, etc. Yeah. Well, that's just a simple way that we can all make a huge difference to this planet. Yeah. 
you know, and you are absolutely right. There's so much research to validate how positive thinking and some of the simple uh, changes like what you're speaking about, smiling, posture, uh, you know, uh, there's this whole thing with the power pose now <laughs> in terms of being able to uh, build your self-confidence. But in terms of, of putting it in the context of a business, mm -hmm. you mentioned something earlier in terms of the risks uh, that are associated when businesses are thinking about being able to uh, inc improve their profit margins, mm -hmm. they don't want to hear that word risk uh, so much. There is a level of risk involved, mm -hmm. but it's about doing better um, and essentially becoming more successful. Mm -hmm. uh, so when initiatives like these, uh, being able to cultivate a workspace where people will be happier may take a bit of investment, mm -hmm. it may not seem to balance out at times. Have you found that to be uh, as an obstacle in the in the areas that you've worked before? If we take your question at a more global level, what mm -hmm. you're really say, talking about is, from what I can see, is attitudes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we often have been socialized into believing is there's a thing called stress. Yeah. We all like to use the word stress because it's convenient. You, my wife, you're stressing me out. You, my daughter, you're stressing me out. You, my son, you're stressing me out. The boss is stressing me out. The job is stressing me out. If you are the boss, the employees are stressing me out. We all look at things outside us and blame things outside us. But if you can change the orientation and realize there is no such thing as stress, it is purely fear. You are scared of the future ramifications of something that's kept going on right now. For instance, you're in traffic, you've got a very important meeting, maybe you have to go on television, <laughs> and you are worried you're not going to make it on time. So you start to blame the traffic or blame, and you, can you change the traffic? Can you change the wife? Can you change the daughter easily? Not, not really, right? But if you realize that what it really is, is your, just your perception that you're out of control and you are scared. Mm -hmm. Well, then you realize then it's all up to you. Keep your emotions under control, just like that woman who complained over 27 little steps. Well, what you're really talking about is changing that. You know, if you can change employees' attitudes, they will be more productive. If you can change employers' attitudes, they will be more willing to take risks, which and usually they may not feel comfortable with, but over time, it's like anything else. You get real good at it. Just that you've been on television many times. I'm sure your very first day was not <laughs> as comfortable. <laughs> Same thing. So how do you uh, trigger within people this kind of a response where Obviously, you may have a one-time meeting with them. They may sit for, how long does one of your sessions last? They can last a very short period of time, through to eight hours or more a day. I'll give you one example. There's a gentleman called El Ellsworth Bishop. He was an HIV unit, and he was very close to death. I come up to, a facil to the facility, and I do a one-hour presentation, and I'm talking about optimism. And at the end of it, I walk away thinking that's the end of it. I'll never hear anything from him again. About a year goes by, and I then end up in a different facility associated with that organization. And it's a, now like a day release type place where they're, they're closer and closer to going back home and not having to live in the hospital. I do a 10-week program there, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, Ellsworth is there. He's out of his HIV um, ward where he was close to death, and he says to me, I listened to what you were saying and said, you're right. I'm going to not die. I'm going to get on and make something in my life. Before you knew it, he was now in this new facility. And when I stood up and did another presentation, on that particular day, he said, I'm going to stop using my walker. I'm going to start trying to use my own two feet. And now he's a productive member of, of the community and no longer is involved in that organization. The reality is it doesn't take much but it takes the person to want to change. Well, but, and, and you've given us several anecdotes so far. What do you, uh, what would you say has been one of the most inspiring uh, moments or results that you've seen from the sessions that you've had? With oh, people? there was, there was. A, I'll give you two. One was in Belize. One was classic. There, there was, I was teaching. It was, people. It was a twenty-seven step lady. 27 step lady? Yeah. No, this, no, 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 no this, is, this, is, this is far more switched on lady. This, this, this lady was wonderful. She, um, I was teaching them to say this, and I'm going to say it very fast. 
If you want a happy horizon, don't have PCP in the morning. PCP in the morning, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance. These are the five <laughs> stages of change <laughs> that people go through when they make a change. Now, I get clients to have races saying things like I just did, all right? Mm -hmm. Well, I just could not <laughs> believe this. One of the recruits at the police academy, she, she told one of the instructors, I'll stand up and I'll sing it. And she stood up and sung it. Oh, it was just amazing. <laughs> so, you know, you can, if you can inspire people in a way that um, they feel comfortable with, you can do amazing things. But I'll give you a far better one. Um, I hear you have a few problems with your gangs here, etc. I worked in a place, a Camelot Counseling Centre, which is 18 to 30-year-olds, um, males, who have drug problems. And I taught them a breathing exercise. And just in case we're running out of time, I, I, I will um, get to the point. I brought the, the boss and the deputy boss down in the room, and I got them to watch. And I asked, let's pretend this is the 18-year-old. The I get them to do the breathing exercise, and then I say to him, Are you, just tap your leg when you're ready for me to do what I'm going to do. He taps his leg, and the boss is watching over there. And I get a pillow, and I hit this guy as hard as I possibly can there. And he doesn't flinch. And the boss is almost out of his seat. Like, what, what are you doing? And he couldn't believe that you could hit somebody so hard and they wouldn't even flinch. So then I said to him, tell the boss, what would you have done if I had done that to you the very first time I saw you? He said, well, you wouldn't be here. I would have punched you in your face and you'd be in the hospital. And I would have been locked upstairs in the, in the jail. You know, it's about trust. It's about respect when you can give people, make them feel comfortable and give them respect so they think that they're, they're being respected. You can change people when they want to change. Now, how do you deal with people who may be resistant and non-believers? I think, uh, Adrian, yeah. you're just talking it. You don't live it. <laughs> well, firstly, you make a very good point in the last few words that you said. You must live it. If I have a stomach out here, am I going to inspire you to exercise? No. <laughs> if I look like I haven't slept in four days, am I going to inspire you to make sure you get your eight hours every single day no. You know, you have to live it. Can I run a happiness program and be unhappy? No. Mm -hmm. So you really have to be a mentor. And that was what I liked about being out at the police academy, that one of the instructors there made a big, uh, he went out of his way to emphasize that you have to act that way if you want other people to follow you. So that's an important part of it. And, you know, that's a very interesting uh, group that you use because when you think of people... Uh, like police officers. Uh, we know we see here, of course, in the media, where every day you are bombarded by negativity. Mm -hmm. um, you, I mean, you can't run from it. And mm -hmm. uh, we can even argue that it extends to the wider community as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you work with them to, despite what they will see every single day, mm -hmm. the worst of society, worst choices people make, um, and still be able to keep that happiness index in, in check? Well, life is about choices. Mm -hmm. You can choose to look at the negative, negative, negative in life, and that's what you'll see. Mm -hmm. Or you can deal with the negative, but see the beauty in life. Mm -hmm. Everybody has their positive traits. There's always something good in people, and you, you don't have to only focus on the negatives. It's your choice. So what does Adrian do when he wakes up and he's having a bad day? Well, he's not allowed to have a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> that's not natural. It, well, we are socialized yeah. into thinking that's not natural, mm -hmm. but why can't you be happy every single day of your life? So when things go wrong or something unfortunate, uh, something you cannot change, uh -huh. takes place, it could be as, as severe as uh, losing a loved one, uh, um, having major health crisis or other issues like that. How do you overcome that? Simple 60-second little techniques that you can teach your kids or your parents or your relatives, a thing called diaphragmatic breathing, which when you get good at it, it, it takes a few minutes to learn, maybe 10 minutes to learn, but once you've learned it, it only takes 30 to 60 seconds. You breathe in through your nose, you let your stomach get bigger. You breathe out through your mouth and let your stomach get smaller. You drop your shoulders, put your hands in your lap, close your eyes, and do it. Now, if you're driving, <laughs> keep your eyes open. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it then. You, you Can really you show want us? it? Yeah, stand up. Let, let well, why don't we all stand yeah, up? Yeah, why don't we all stand up? <laughs> Let's improve Go the on, happiness William. index. Yeah. Hey, so really, William's so, the resistant let, one. Let me, so. let me take it. <laughs> no. <laughs> he has this part down. All right. Hey, so, oh, even so I'm this is myself. called, what is this called? Diaphragmatic 
breathing. Diaphragmatic. This is what singers do. Um, kind of? No, no, no. They no. probably do something slightly different. Okay. okay. So all you have to do, all right, now you can keep your eyes open, but I'll keep my eyes closed just mm -hmm. so other people can see. So you guys are in the car, if you like, and I'm at my desk in the office. So all you do is you breathe in through your nose and let your stomach get bigger. And then you breathe out through your mouth and let your stomach get smaller. And that's all you have to do. Now, just to, to learn it, it often helps to put one hand here, not on the microphone, <laughs> and one on the stomach. And all you do is make sure this hand does not move, but this hand moves. All right? So we breathe in through our nose, and our stomach gets bigger. And then out through our mouth, and our stomach gets smaller. Yeah. Now, if your audience are uh, really picking on, they'll <laughs> notice that some of you did not move your bottom hand as much as you should, but others did. Mm -hmm. right. But we'll do it one more time. And we'll, 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 we'll watch William in particular, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, yeah. So as you breathe in through your nose, let your stomach get bigger. And then out through your mouth and let your stomach get smaller, 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 smaller. There you go. Right. Now you can put your hands down and then you could just do it normally. Right? And on television set, it might be a bit more difficult, <laughs> especially with the tight clothes, etc. But what you'll find is all of a sudden it gets very easy. Um, for instance, I'm not going to get you to do it now, but if you lie on the ground on your back and you'll put your feet on the chair, you'll find, as I have done in two facilities already in Belize, after they've done it for only about one or two minutes and you ask them to stand up, you can stand up. Even if you don't want to, you can stand up. <laughs> they won't. Because they feel so relaxed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are we all feeling better now? <laughs> <laughs> so how does, and, and this is also a part, I, I was looking through uh, some of your training that you're doing, and, and it is teaching things like breathing exercises and relaxation tips. And um, a lot of people underestimate, the, the experience you spoke about, about teaching people breathing techniques, I had a similar one teaching uh, some of the basics to anger management to at risk youth and it was the same thing they look at you and they say breathing mm -hmm. in a heated moment mm -hmm. stop mm -hmm. in a heated moment um can, what is the science behind it why does it why does it help it decreases your heart rate it decreases your blood pressure um you you start to use this part of the brain opposed to the part in the middle this is called your prefrontal cortex and it's the part of the brain associated with making good decisions. Your amygdala is associated with, make, with emotions, anger, fear, scared, shy, whatever. Do you want to be using that part of the brain or this part of the brain? You want to be using this part of the brain clearly. And how you do it is just by breathing causes you to relax. The relaxing causes a very complicated physiological response which we won't talk about. And then next thing you know, you're thinking more positively. It's a simple technique that has a very complex physiological reason why it happens. But basically, one of the things that happens is you don't secrete cortisol. When you secrete cortisol, you sabotage yourself. Right here, right now, if we are nice and relaxed, we're growing our skin, we're growing our hair. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I was looking over to see the impact. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're decreasing my happiness in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I'm joking, I'm joking. But what happens is when we relax, that's what norm normally happens. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are stressed out, as you have been told to believe you are, or you're angry, or you're frustrated, or any negative emotions, you suppress your immune system a little bit. And if you keep doing that often enough, eventually, your skin doesn't grow as quickly. Your hair doesn't grow so quickly. And as a consequence, you're more likely to get eczema. You're more likely to, your heart will not, not regenerate itself as well. Next thing you know, you're more likely to have a heart attack, more likely to have cancer. I'll give you one example that really shows you the power of this. Let's imagine that you're in France in 1997 to 1998, and in that one-year period, you are told by a doctor, here's our doctor, that she, she tells you <laughs> you've got neck cancer, sorry, or you have head cancer. 101 people are told by this doctor that's what, what's going on in your life. These people get normal me med medical treatment, but they're also asked six questions. Is the future going to be good? What's going to happen to you in the future? And then they wait one year to see what happens. Forty-five of them are dead. And who were they? Were they the ones that said, my future is lousy and it's only going to get worse? Or were they the ones who said, my future is going to be better and I'm going to have a great life? 
clearly, the ones who said, my future is not good, were the ones who ended up dying. The, the way you think is really powerful. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy. I am still trying to figure out how you get employers to believe that this is important. Mm -hmm. Well, because, no, and, and I want to put it in context because the, the, the thing is, you can inspire so often, and it happens with all trainings. Yeah. Uh, you go into a training session on efficiency, on productivity, on some of the technical aspects of your job even, and uh, you have a very inspiring educational time, um, and then you're put back in the same work environment. And it's difficult to be able to, uh, to use the skills that you have been equipped with. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you ensure when that happens, that uh, you, you have a, a group of highly energized, uh, you know, uh, now newly skilled persons willing to make a change who will return to an environment that isn't the same um, to be able to still keep on with the knowledge that you've taught them? Okay, well, I'll say two things. Yeah. Firstly, the training has to provide you skills. Yeah. There's one thing to be all energizing and motivating and be like a motivational speaker, yeah. which I am not. All right, please. <laughs> you, yeah, that, that's lovely. But the reality is a lot of theory, a lot of ideas is great, but you need practical skills. Mm -hmm. And you need it. And a lot of the training you'll get is do this for 20 minutes a day, two times a day. Well, who's going to do a breathing exercise two times a day for 20 minutes each time? They're not. You need practical skills, and you need to give them a lot of skills. So don't just give them breathing. Don't just give them PMR. Don't just give them meditation. Give them a whole lot of things, and then they can try them at home and see what will work. So that's the first thing. The second thing for the employer's aspect, well, which costs more for an employer? To have an employee either die, get sick, and so there's absent, or resign, and to have to retrain somebody else, or keep the person. And, and allow them to try some of these new things. Of course, the second option is the cost-efficient one. Mm -hmm. the, what, what you're really getting at is, once again, is an attitude thing. What, is, what do a lot of employers do? Do they positively and reinforce, well done, well done, well done, or do they punish when you do badly? Well, sadly, and I worked in restaurant industry for about 18 years part-time, mm -hmm. I have seen many a chef blow yeah. up at their, <laughs> their um, employees because they did the wrong thing, but you very, very, very rarely hear them say, well, that Good was job. well done, that was well done. Yeah. And as we saw before, all it takes is a smile, mm -hmm. and you can prove people's productivity. A smile costs an employer nothing, but, uh, but telling them that they've done the wrong thing costs them a huge <laughs> amount. That person will not be as productive. They won't be as creative. So that's one, one, one shift that can be made, uh, being able to affirm uh, employees or co-workers because you could do it amongst each other yeah. is there anything else that uh, in terms of making shifts within the workplace uh, that can be highly effective in terms of a, a collective group absolutely I mean uh, there's a Japanese business that went to New Jersey and what they got we should do it actually can we can we do this <laughs> let's stand up this, this will be fun this will be fun I'm already doing you're making my sure that right, oh wait doing some exercise as well <laughs> Thank you for hey, um, I'll talk, talk about a different business first. A different yeah. business asked their employees to look in the mirror and say the following words. Okay. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. I am beautiful. <laughs> Not a really good strategy to do every day. But what a different business, a Japanese business did, hold each other's hands, and what they got each other to do is say, you are beautiful. Come on. You are beautiful. 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 Good. Absolutely. Now, as much as that may seem silly, what did all three of you do? You smiled. Smile. You relaxed. You weren't secreting cortisol. And you don't have to do that every day. You could do a different one every day. And that what you could do is you could lead one one day. You could lead another. You could lead another. And I could lead another. And so we would all go home and we have to be creative of how we could do something. And it only takes a few seconds to make somebody laugh and smile. And you will be more productive during the day. Mm -hmm. And let's imagine that the CEO the top person of any business could have the courage to overcome their fears, stop using the word stress, and join in, hold hands and do something like that. You know, one of the things that I, um, that people like about how I present is I just present at the level that they are at. And it's the same thing for a CEO. Yes, you have to do, you have, sometimes you have to fire people, you have to be the disciplinarian. But at the same time, if you can actually get down to the level of employees, mm -hmm. people like this. 
right. So, so <laughs> <laughs> how do people get an opportunity to meet and interact with Adrian? Okay, well, the Chamber have organized um, um, trainings with Adrian here in Belize City, also in Belmopan. The training in Belmopan will be the 7th, and uh, it's an entire day, 8 to 5, at the George Price Center. And here in Belize, it'll be from the 8th to 10th, uh, the Biltmore Plaza, and uh, also.